And 48 hours later, I'm in Bogota <laughs> with Bob Dietz, and we're looking at this solution pit, uh, or this round hole in the Andes Mountains, outside of a, an old, quaint little colonial town called Tequendama. And it took us about uh, a half a day of walking around this thing to dismiss it as an impact. It did not have the the characteristics in Bob's mind of what you would expect. This is my first experience with uh, a meteorite impact crater. Um, a couple of years earlier, I had been in Vietnam. I had the pleasure of being drafted <laughs> and sent, and I saw lots of craters, so I knew <laughs> pretty much what small craters look like. In fact, I made a lot of them. <laughs> and one of the local questions there in in uh, Colombia in the Andes was, how deep is this thing? And nobody seemed to know. Well, well, we don't know, we don't know. And it wasn't a very big crater, it was only about 400 meters across. So Bob says, peel down, here, take this rock in this string. So we swam out to the middle of that crater and lowered the string, and it was only about 15 meters deep. And we came back. Um, just on a little side note here, uh, early this year, I got a letter from a researcher who was compiling mountain lakes all over the place, and he wanted a copy of our bathymetric map of how we conducted the survey. <laughs> so it, it took me just a couple of minutes on the telephone to, to fix his chart. <laughs> At any rate, I've been working on impact craters ever since. Uh, Bob was a pioneer in, in this particular field, and I've grown to learn, learn a lot about impact craters on Earth. And what we're dealing with in today's topic is quite different from my, my real experience. I work with a hard target, something that has suffered uh, ferocious impact and the equivalent of an explosion. Uh, in order to understand what these things are, you'd better have a little bit of a background in other holes in the ground, what uh, karst sinkholes look like, what uh, volcanic craters look like, what the projectiles that come in from space look like, and what you can expect uh, to be there. Now, when a cometary uh, shower was first brought to my attention concerning the, the, uh, this particular topic, I saw the, the published abstracts from the Acapulco AGU meeting. And my first thought was, these guys are wacko. <laughs> what are they talking about? Uh, they were proposing almost, it was as if they were grasping for straws to support an impact of any kind. Uh, they were throwing out the Carolina Bays, the, the thousands of little round lakes along the eastern seaboard. They were uh, talking about magnetic spherules. They were talking about uh, mammoth bones with impacted iron fragments in them, <laughs> and said, well, I'd better take another look at this. I dismissed it at first, but then I'd better take another look at it. And as more and more formal publications come out, uh, there's, there's a lot of information in here that I don't quite understand. I don't, I don't follow just where the, the nano diamonds are coming from. I do know that my Australian colleagues uh, who work with diamond exploration tell me that micro diamonds are so common that they're useless as a prospecting tool. You can't use them to track back. Well, this doesn't really negate uh, Ted's story about these things being widely spread, but what are we talking about? How big are these things? The size of a cold virus? Who's qualified to find them? How do you separate them from your sample? There are a lot of questions that are going to deserve a closer, longer look. Um, quartz is the most common and most abundant mineral on our Earth's crust, and it's a tough one. It, it, uh, once quartz is formed, it's very difficult to get rid of it, and that's why it's so well studied, and that's why it has been detected as a tool for shock metamorphism. When a high-speed projectile comes from outer space, smacks into a sandstone, a lot of that quartz can be damaged in ways that are identifiable by a skilled operator, 
and according to the public press, by almost anybody, <laughs> uh, as having suffered a shock event. Uh, you develop little um, optical planes inside the quartz grains. Well, here at the, at the Pleistocene, end of the Pleistocene event, there are no quartz fragments. Uh, and to look for that, that happening, how do you do that? Well, you do away with the crater. You don't have a sandstone target. You, you have to impact someplace else. And ice certainly gets, a, gets rid of it. If you were to make a big crater in a uh, continental glacier, um, and the glacier melts, where did the evidence go? It, it has to come only from the projectile itself. And there, I'm not really that well versed. I don't know what comets are made of. And in fact, every time a, a spacecraft comes back with new data, they're made of something else. <laughs> they're, uh, it's not quite a garbage can, but uh, if you want something strange, you can you can uh, uh, put it in a comet body and then do away with it by blowing the thing up. Um, I've worked on very similar projects and even with Ted down here at the end, and uh, we don't always agree, but we're uh, friendly antagonists. <laughs> And many times we do agree. <laughs> uh, my experience with anthropologists and archaeologists, almost all of it comes from my graduate work at University of Illinois, where the geology people, especially the field geology people, the anthropologists and the archaeologists, hung out in the same bars. <laughs> I, I learned to, to really get along with the archaeologists. They would sit down and drink lots of beer. And I learned to get along pretty well with the anthropologists, but the South American guys kept coming back with their own drugs, and, and that was a little risky, and I stayed away from the chemists. They made their own, and that was really, really bad. But this was my field of exposure to anthropology, and we cross-fertilized a lot of good ideas. There were many projects that, that went into the field. Uh, they were aware of what impact craters looked like, were aware of what volcanoes looked like, uh, it, was, it was really rewarding. I'm kind of happy to be here in front of this bunch. Um, I noticed in your early program that beer is considered a gift item. It's a <laughs> and I said, yeah, okay, those are the ones I remember. Uh, but I'm not sold on all of what they're calling the ET markers. Uh, iron spherules are awfully common in modern sediments. They're a product of industrial processes. Um, smokestacks are loaded with them. It's not just iron, it's an iron nickel content that defines what a meteorite is. Uh, if you have a lot of iron around, did it come from a meteorite or did it come from a comet? The, the material or the information we right now have of uh, comets is that they have very little iron in them. Meteorites have iron in them. Uh, so what is it you're dealing with here? Uh, a good solid meteorite that no, no. Uh, how did you get that iron? I don't really know. The volume of the nano diamonds, I, I'm not comfortable with that yet. Uh, I did attend last night's talk, and uh, just as a, a educational aid, they tossed out a slide that showed this sphere the size of Manhattan sitting over Manhattan, and said if you took all of the nano diamonds and put them back together, this is the size that you would get. Well, what we know about interplanetary dust particles and some information on comet captured uh, particles is that yes, my nano diamonds do exist, but they're sprinkled very, very sparsely through the host material. Now, if we glue all of the, the target uh, material, if we glue all of these nano diamonds back together and we get a sphere the size of Manhattan, well, how big did that parent body have to be? This is getting awfully large, and that's when you start entering, uh, uh, well, uh, the item itself, the, the projectile itself, is larger in diameter than our atmosphere. How did it break up? Was it gravity that broke it up? Did it break up by the atmosphere? Did it, what happened here? It's a field for a lot of future research. Um, the other markers and the other stories uh, 